Um, I'm Jim Cornell. Unfortunately, Kathy couldn't be here today. She came to get things set up, but she's not feeling that great, so she's uh, she's left it with myself and in the capable hands of Janina, who uh, Janina Little is now working full time with us, or going to be as of another week or so. Um, so that's good news for her. She's working on the adoptions, and we'll also st talk about some of the things that she's going to be working on in northern Nevada in a little while. Um, if my phone rings, please forgive that because I'm on call right now for the tortoise group hotline. So if it does ring, it's probably a tortoise group call. Everybody else has been, not that I know anybody in Las Vegas that would be calling me, so anybody calls, it's going to be a tortoise group call. Um, I also, by the way, with regards to the, uh, the, the hotline, I do appreciate everybody that, that does that. It's my first time being on the hotline and, and some of the calls are interesting to say the least, so I do appreciate everybody that does that. Uh, it's, uh, it, and, and especially when the phone rings at about 11.30 at night and you're kind of a little bit groggy and somebody's asking you a question about sulcatas and you have no clue what they're talking about. <laughs> That, that was pretty much what I said. Uh, what I should, what I really should have done is just said, you know what, Janina knows a lot more about. Janina knows a lot more than I do, and just given her phone number out. But I, I didn't. I was a little more tactful than that. Um, I'm kind of switching the uh, agenda around a little bit because Kathy's not here. So we'll, what we'll do is we'll try and get through uh, some of the what's been happening with Tortoise Group for the last little while since our last meeting. And uh, and again, thanks all for being here. We really appreciate not only is there anybody here for the first time? Is there a first. Oh, great. Okay. All right. Some new adoptees and uh, some people that. Uh, that got, a, got the tortoise reasonably recently. That's good. So, what we've been doing recently, we, uh, we had a group meeting, or a group visit to the home of Norm Schilling, who does landscaping around Las Vegas, and uh, his home was quite spectacular. It wasn't really a great opportunity to, for everybody to, to chat, because everybody was so into the plants and into the garden and, and enjoying the garden. But a, a great trip. Uh, about 35 people showed up to that one. Um, it's it's great to have these events so that people can come along. And, and also, we try and keep these as one of the exclusive things that members can enjoy. The following week uh, it was kind of one of those things where we were cramming them all in. But that's just the way that it works. Every once in a while, you just have to go with whatever everybody else is doing and we had an opportunity to go and visit the Desert Tortoise Conservation Center for probably the last time before it closes at the end of the year so it was a good opportunity to see what they're doing and see some tortoises a few of them were out at that time and just uh, find out what's going on and, and the kind of things that they were doing a couple of weeks ago, we were at the Cashman Center for the Big Science Expo. We had around 700 people come out to the booth during the day. It was a long day, but it was a lot of fun. And again, I see a few people here that were volunteering on that day, so thanks again for, for helping with that. And I think I've just destroyed the clicker. Hopefully, I, I just put it down. Um, we had about 700 people come out and one of the interesting things that happened was I got a call about 10 days ago from a school asking if they could make a donation because they wanted to donate to a local environmental group and it just happens that somebody that came to the event had picked up one of the flyers and one of the little information sheets and so they called and wanted to give us a donation that the school had raised so that's uh, one of the reasons why it's nice to go to these things sometimes at the end of the day when you're really tired and you've not made any concrete adoptions or Sometimes you feel a little bit discouraged, but it's nice that these things do pan out. And sometimes it can be six months, a year down the road when somebody goes through the things that they had in their bag and all of a sudden you get an adoption out of it. So they're very worthwhile events. The next one is our big visit to Northern Nevada that's coming up at the end of the month. Um, one of the problems that we have here, the DTCC's closing, there's a lot more tortoises here than there are homes for and in the last couple of months 
Janine has been working on this really hard, but we've had three places where we've had about 60 tortoises come into our hands from three different places due to deaths of, of people that were breeding them or had a big collection of tortoises. So one person had, well, we went out there, we counted 20 some, he thought that he had only 20. Turns out it's closer to 30. Um, <clears throat> these, thing, these things happen, and tortoises live a long time, as we all know. Um, and, and if you have 20 or 30 of them and you decide that you're going to move or that something happens, as in the cases that we've had, we've had three deaths and we've inherited 60 tortoises that we have to try and find homes for. So that, that's added to the issue of the DTCC closing and also the issues that we have at this time of year when there are lots of tortoises anyway. So one of the um, things that we approach the U.S. Federal uh, Fish and Wildlife Service about was trying to expand the range of tortoise adoptions and fortunately, which is why Janine is able to come on with us full time, they, they are supporting that financially for us. So we've got some injection of money from, from, from them to go up and do some adoptions in northern Nevada. Now it's a different climate slightly. Um, borough construction is a little different. We're starting to try and put some information online about how to care for tortoises in that climate. But we're going up there on May the 31st to Reno and the 1st of June in Gardnerville and we're going to give some workshops on how to care for tortoises, try and drum up some more adoptions. We've already had probably 20 or 30 people that say they're going to attend and that's generally a good thing beforehand because what usually happens is it the last two or, two or three days before when everybody starts to uh, take an interest. We're going up at different times. Janina and Kathy are probably going up a little later than me. I'm going up to do some radio and television interviews. Uh, we sent out some press releases already and there's been some pretty good uptake within about five minutes of sending it. I'd, I'd done two radio interviews and, two, and uh, an interview for a newspaper. So I'm going to go up a couple of days early to do some more of those. And Kathy and Janina will go and do some site visits. She's already working with some people up in northern Nevada who are going to be hopefully adopting and they're already starting to get their their uh, burrows ready and there's quite a lot of excitement up there. Um, one of the things that we did want to mention is we're going to be doing these tortoise workshops in northern Nevada. We wanted to put it out to, to you, the membership and the group, as to whether we should do one here as well, uh, as to whether that's a good idea. So maybe if you want to think about that one and maybe we'll have a little show of hands later as to whether anybody thinks that repeating one of those down here would be a good idea or whether we, uh, whether we really don't, don't need to do that. Um, yeah, that's pretty, pretty much it for the Northern Nevada one. We were very excited to go and hoping that it alleviates some of the problem that we have down here with numbers of, of, uh, of tortoises. As you can see from the PowerPoint, We've got some new designs that we've been working on and hopefully everybody likes the, the new design of the Tortoise Group logo. It's just an excuse to buy new t-shirts is what it is really. But, um, we've been working on a, f a few different things. Hopefully everybody's seen the new newsletter by now and that's a, a bit of a redesign as well. Kind of goes to my background and I enjoy doing these things. So, Not that I have a lot of free time but we're also redoing all of the information sheets. We're going to be taking up packages to Northern Nevada to hand out, and a part of that is trying to look as professional as we can. Yes? I don't want to interrupt. Is it too cold in Reno? It is colder, but uh, not too cold. It's going to rely upon uh, tortoises being brought in in the wintertime when, when it's cold. That's the uh, really the only, unless Janine has got anything to add to that. Just that yeah. we're bringing them in. And like a, in an unheated area, either a garage or a shed so that they can still roommate. Uh, they can still get cold enough, but not too cold, not freezing cold. So that's the, that's the plan. They do that there now and they do just fine. So there are tortoises up there already. Yeah, so there are, there are already tortoises there and also there are, are guidelines for Utah and Arizona and parts of California where it certainly gets cold as well. So there are places that, that do have adoptions and do have tortoises so we're just 
really capitalizing on that and hoping that uh, hoping it's going to be okay. But it, it's there have been people up there that have had tortoises for many years, so it's just just a case of trying to make sure that the protocols are all the same because, uh, as with everything else. Things change, people make up their own rules, people change things, they adapt something that they thought that somebody else was doing that they saw on a website and, and all of a sudden you've got some really different um, approaches to, to dealing with these things. So that's one of the reasons for us going up there is so that we can help people and to try and standardize it so that people are, are doing what's the best practice for the tortoise. All right, back to well, pretty much done with the designs, but we're, we're certainly almost uh, almost finished on the designs. We're working on them. We're, we're, the next thing is going to be the website. We're going to do a redesign of the website. We've already started moving things over with the website. We've moved to an Office 365 environment, which has caused massive headaches. Uh, if anybody has had any problems with the website, that's why. Uh, some of the adoption forms haven't been working properly, some of the other forms not working properly, but we're gradually working through them. We're going to be changing a few things around and we're going to do a redesign of the website as well, so more videos and more timely things, more integration with social media, um, lots of different things that we're going to be doing once we get the time. As the Zoni, Kathy, myself and Janina, it's kind of, uh, kind of tough to get everything done and everything's a priority all at the same time. But that's the way that it works. Uh, we, are, we are getting some new t-shirts. Uh, I think it was last year there was a contest where somebody had submitted a design um, which we thought was really cool and in my previous life to this one working at an aquarium we had some magic t-shirts which we couldn't keep on the shelf so I thought it would be a great idea for that. So basically what it is is it's a, a neat little t-shirt on, on white that looks kind of neat and the uh, the name of the, the student who designed it, Tino Sampson, um, the school themselves, it's uh, Eva Wolf Elementary School, we're going to be help working with them, they're already trying to sell t-shirts to all of the students and they've got quite a lot of orders already. So we're also donating a dollar of every sale to the school so that we can help with their tortoise habitat because they have a tortoise habitat. So it's sort of a, they're helping us, we're helping them. And um, we're hoping that there are plenty of sales in this. It's one of those things where I think that we're buying a lot of kids sizes, but a lot of adults are probably gonna want them as well. And, and the way that they work, where I was at the aquarium in Canada, this didn't always work very well because it's not always sunny, but what what happens is that when you go outside in the, the uh, into the sun, the t-shirt changes color. So you, you end up with a, a nice colored t-shirt. So hopefully they'll sell well and that we'll have to put in lots and lots of orders for these things. And you can buy adult sizes, so watch out for these on the, on the website in, in the near future and you'll be able to buy them. And if you're a tortoise group, <coughs> tortoise group member, you'll get a discount, which we like to, uh, we like to do for, for members. And it's also an incentive for people to, to buy them. But they, uh, the company did a very good design on that one for us. It's not exactly true to a desert tortoise, so you know, it's, it's, it's close. Um, the other thing that I, that I personally attended was the AN conference, which is the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits. And there was a couple of sessions there that we particularly wanted to go to, and one of them was on fundraising, and the other one was on uh, building a, an effective board of directors. So we're, we're working on both of those things now, trying to improve our fundraising. And, and the whole point of this was not to ask anybody for money unless anybody specifically wants to uh, to empty their pockets. But what we what we learned from this conference is that everybody knows people. So a lot of places have charitable foundations in places that they work. So if anybody feels so inclined um, to find out from employers or from friends or relatives if they're involved in any of these charities. Because what tends to happen is Las Vegas is no different to anywhere else. People give at home. People in, in companies and companies give at home too. Um, and often what will happen is 
places of work have charitable foundations and they give donations to local charities. So uh, if anybody knows of any, anything like that, please feel free to get in touch with Kathy or myself so that we can try and chase down some much needed dollars for the, uh, for the group. That's the, the plug over. And upcoming events, the next event here is going to be on Saturday, June the 21st, when we'll be having a session on tortoise digestion and nutrition. So maybe we should have the refreshments before, I don't know, is it, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether we should do that. Um, it's going to be an interesting one. I don't know if anybody has read the newsletter, the, the center section on tortoise digestion. The person that wrote that is Jennifer, who's going to be coming and making that presentation. So it's going to be, it's going to be a, an interesting one. I think that's the end of the first slideshow. Yes. So next is, uh, is Janina going to be talking about early summer behavior. Um, just a couple of other little things, little housekeeping things as well if, that we should go through that Kathy would have been doing had she been here. Um, just a, a little poll as to if anybody has a tortoise that hasn't come out yet. So everybody's, everybody's is out. <coughs> All right, that's, that's good news. I guess it's getting to that time of year when it's getting, getting quite warm. It was around 100 yesterday, 100 again today, so I guess everybody's tortoises are starting to appear. Mega Diet is available, another plug for, uh, for sales. Uh, $8 for members, $12 for non-members. Comes in a 22 ounce bag and also comes in a, a big sack. Um, we also need, if anybody knows of one, a location for the next mega diet bagging, whether it's a church hall or somewhere for the next mega diet bagging that we're going to be doing. It's a, it's a lot of fun. I went out to my first one about two days after I came here and it was, it was a lot of fun. So we basically just split the bags and put them into smaller bags for, for resale and, uh, and eat chips and drink pop. And uh, we're not sure yet when it's going to be. No, it's going to be in the next, probably in the next month. So if anybody has a location for Saturday or Sunday that would uh, that would work for us, that would be great. How big? Uh, the last one we did in someone's garage. It, yeah. It, yeah. It, if we're doing a big one with 50, 60 people, then a church hall would be ideal. Preferably something with a concrete floor, because the stuff does fa fall everywhere, and uh, and I was kind of bad at that. I probably lost about a half of mine, but you can sweep it up. Um, we also, something else that we're working on is a hatchling foster care program. And again, thank you to the people that have responded to our requests for people to help out with the hatchling and the fostering. Um, we do have a few people that are already working on that. Uh, we've got three people getting ready and one person already taking hatchlings. So as the season progresses, we'll see if we need to build any more. I think we're probably okay right now, but certainly we don't know whether we're going to need more as the, as the summer progresses. Uh, the hatchlings will be translocated to the large-scale translocation site near uh, Jean this fall or potentially next spring. So anything that comes in, there has to be a quarantine, so there might be a need for more over the, uh, over the fall and winter. Uh, I will, I guess, pass it over to Janina now to do the little presentation on early summer behavior, and she can uh, also mention mentioned today's freebies as well. well let's go on to um, early summer behavior and um, so guess who that is there you go good job guys <laughs> um, so uh, tortoise behavior um, fluctuates throughout the year. It does change depending on season. They act a little differently and so we're, we're just going to go over what's um, this is summer behavior versus uh, last time we talked about spring behavior. So, and that's the end of the slideshow, though. Jim, Jim, that's the end of the slideshow. Thanks for coming. No, I'm <laughs> oh, Powell, you got it. Thank you. 
How do I go? I mean, I could scroll through all the way back, is it, but. Is it? You want to scroll through? Okay. The easiest way. I have, I have a question. One more yeah, way. sure. Um, I've looked at what tortoises can and cannot eat, and I've seen a couple of websites that has someone at this level Mars. Can they eat the flowers from the desert willow tree? Yes. Okay. Yes. And what about lantanas? Um, I've heard different things on lantana as well. So I've heard different things on lantana as well. Okay. I don't believe it is on our list no. um, because I think we were told by a veterinarian that it um, does something to one of their organs, either their liver or their kidney, I don't remember. That would be a great question for next week though. Or next month, sorry. Next month. So um, I've heard different things. I've seen them eat it, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily good for them. Yeah. Great question. And we're going to have a little section after I'm all done with uh, questions and answers and stories. So think about if you have a tortoise story that you want to share. You don't have to come up. You can just do it from your seat. But that's, we'll get through this real quick. Um, so we're talking about May and June. And let's see what, what your tortoise is up to. And I'm pretty sure that's Tad again, too. He's the poster child for now. Um, how has it changed? So tortoises are, um, they're maybe they're not sunning themselves as much. They're, they finally warmed up their body temperature. And so now they're ready to move. They're ready to go. They're ready to get around your yard and eat and they want to browse. They're able to um, digest food. They're at a proper temperature and their metabolism is going. So they're able to enjoy your backyard, which is a good thing because you get to spend a lot of time with them. Um, but you also have to make sure that your yard is safe too. So we want to look for any hazards, any place where they can get stuck flipped over, turned over, and especially escape. Um, we know that how heartbreaking it is to hear that your tortoise has escaped. So we want to push gate barriers. You want to check your fences um, and make sure that they can't slide through, tip up and slide through. That's something they can very easily do. Um, so what else? So browsing and they're eating a whole bunch, probably more than what you ever could think a tortoise could eat. But um, they're coming out earlier and going into the burrow earlier. Um, so they're, they're out in the mid part of the day, usually. Um, now, this is a interesting concern, fighting among males. Um, so if you have had two cute little tortoises and they're finally gotten to the seven or eight inches and they're coming out, becoming a man, they um, can very, easily fight each other. We have, we have more going on. We'll show pictures and that can be dangerous too. Or courting. That too. Maybe your two cute little tortoises. One ends up being a female. One ends up being a male. And that's um, definitely an interesting, you know, that's a concern for us because we already have way too many tortoises to, to rehome. Um, you, if you have a female, she may be looking for a place to lay eggs. So that's something to watch for too. We'll have more on that. And if we have any rain, they might come out and they smell the rain beforehand. Um, so one very important thing with browsing is to, that's, that's what we promote first. That's the most important way a tortoise needs to eat, is to have a variety of plants on our, from our plant list that we know are safe and edible. And they know when they're hungry. And because they need to become a certain temperature in order to metabolize and digest the food, they know when they're ready for that. We don't necessarily do. Um, so they need to be able to access food at all times. And then if you also want to go on vacation for a couple of days, you can do that too without any worries. Yeah. Um, so is the thing that I'm just curious, is, is that kind of a one-time thing? If you put it out and they don't eat it, can you kind of regroup it, put it in a plastic thing and put it out again the next day or is it like a yeah, what I recommend is, um, so Mega Diet, you want to feed two to three times a week in a juicy mash. And um, we've had some people say that cockroaches and ants love it. So we don't necessarily want to leave it all day unless you absolutely have to. Or overnight. Yeah, or overnight. But, it's extra, they didn't get it. Yeah, and sometimes they're not interested in it and they'll just walk right over it. 
and we don't want to throw that away. I'd say you can you can refrigerate it for a couple of days and use it the next time. I wouldn't keep it longer than two two times though. Um, it's made out of grasses. It can become moldy, and um, so we do want to use it in a timely manner. But yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so independent when you're away, when you want to go on vacation for for a few days, they have enough plants and they'll be okay. Um, so tortoises may love a plant in the spring and they won't even touch it in the, in the fall or vice versa. Just because you plant something and they're not munching on it right away, that doesn't mean that they're not going to eat it later on. Um, they, ha they have wonderful taste buds and they can smell things very well. So they go through moods and hormonal changes. So don't worry if they didn't eat those gazanias right away. Maybe when they come out, you know, in three months from now, they're going to chomp them all up. And I, I like to think it's a, it's a way of getting different nutritional values as well. Maybe they need to eat this plant because it has some type of nutrition in it. I'd like to think that, but um, again, tortoise selection is very within the season. Um, one thing I want to point out that I always recommend into every single yard I go into is a grape plant. And that's because they are easy, they grow here, and they're beautiful, and they just, tortoises just munch them up, they're terrific. Um, so I would always recommend planting it, not to where it has to go up on a trellis, or maybe a low trellis, or just on a couple of wires hung up to the wall, so that it creates a shady area that the tortoise can eat around, go under, we want to limit the grapes. We want to either trim them off, either you want to grow them for yourselves and eat them. I've never done that, but I've heard some people, they say they're great. Uh, tortoises, um, so grapes are, sh are fruit. Tortoises lack an enzyme to digest sugar, and so we want to stay away from all types of fruit. If they do eat fruit, um, they can, parasites eat sugar that's in their system, so they can get parasites, and also they can get um, very painful gas. And we all know how that is, right? So, <laughs> so this is just a picture of, a of one example of a grape plant. Um, it's just kind of gone up under the wall where there's little wires, and this was in March, and it's you know, um, not very full here. And this is May, so in one month, look how much has grown. It's all on the ground where the tortoise could go and munch on. And he actually, this used to be a lot bigger right here, but he already ate everything. So, so yeah. These are desert grapes, you No, these are just Thompson seedless from... Yeah, desert Yeah, that might, I'm sure that would be great too. But he doesn't. Might not, might not eat them. Like, a, they're all different. <laughs> the other thing to point out with, with a lot of these plants as well is it takes a plant a lot of energy to produce flowers and produce fruit. So if you remove, if you don't want to grow the grapes for yourself, and you remove fruit early yeah. and remove the flowers, they put more of their growth into the actual foliage. So it, in terms of growing something for for your tortoise, that, that is a help. Oh, yeah. So you might want to trim them early so that they get a lot more uh, leaves. Um, so we have a couple other pictures of different plants. Yellow trailing primrose and um, that's a very pretty plant and it just kind of grows all on the ground. And it will take over your backyard. That is true, it will take over your backyard, but you know. <laughs> Mexican evening primrose is blooming right now. That's that bright pink flower. It might be in landscapes or in your, your neighbor's yards, or in your yard too. It kind of looks like grass the rest of the year, but right now it's bright pink, it's beautiful. That's another primrose. So primroses are great. Gazanias just went through their blooming season. Those are the, they might be white, they might be yellow, they might be orange, they kind of look like daisies, but they come in a little bunch, and they come up and they're, it's like the whole little bunch is, uh, is flowered. We don't, he already ate all the flowers on this. Can you say that again, gazanias? Gazanias. G-A-Z-A-N-I, I think. Gazanias. Um, so that's also a great one. And uh, both of those are available at Star Nursery um, or Plant Warren, usually. Dandelions, that's a wonderful free resource. Um, 
I would recommend um, collecting the seeds but from places but not the flowers. We don't know if any pesticides have been used on these plants and we don't want to accidentally poison our, wonder, our lovely tortoises. Um, so you might want to ask friends and family if you can take seeds only out of their yards uh, but not the actual plant and get them grown in your backyard. Either you have a little patch of grass or you can just water them in a little pot to get them started. They're really easy to grow and they're free. better. Petunias, we all know what petunias look like. We put a little cover on this one so that he could only get the, um, the flowers and that seemed to, to keep the, the flowers there. But we want to, I've heard darker colors have more nutrition if you can. So darker colored petunias would be best. And those are, you know, you get a whole bunch for a dollar right now. Globe mallows, that's another plant that I always recommend if possible. Um, there's that Mexican evening <coughs> primrose that's blooming right now. Um, globe mallows come in a variety of different colors. Usually you see them out in the desert in the wild, that bright coral, it's a bush. And you see it at Red Rock, out in the desert, on the side of the highway when you're out there. It's a bright coral, the ones that uh, occur in the wild. Um, but you can get them in, in like a light pink or a, a purple from Star Nursery or you, you should call about that one first. Those get picked up very fast. So that's a Mexican evening primrose. Kind of, it's mixed in with Bermuda grass because it kind of looks like grass when it's not flowering. What's next? Desert willow. This is another, this is a, a bush that you can turn into a tree that's, that's blooming right now. Comes in uh, light pink to dark purple, all bunch of different colors. And so tortoises, if you have a spoiled tortoise, won't necessarily eat them if they fall on the ground. You'll have to go pick them and then feed them fresh. So that's, that's them. It's a beautiful tree though and it doesn't take too much water. That um, grows out in the desert here as well. So Hollyhock are these big stalks of flowers, the big round flowers that you'll have to pick off for your tortoise. They can't climb that high usually. Um, so we're going to talk about sexing the tortoise because they might be coming out this year and if you had a smaller, a smaller tortoise they might be coming out showing signs of what kind of sex they are because you can't tell until they're seven or eight inches in the shell length not including the head or the tail and um, I have a picture that will show. We want to look at the bottom part of the tortoise but when you want to pick up a tortoise you don't want to flip it over so you might need, you might need a Helper, you want to be my helper? I'm holding the tortoise and you got to, you're, you're going to hold the tortoise. It. He's holding the tortoise, well, right. flat, you know, not tipping him, holding him tight because he might be wiggling around and you want to look underneath, have your second person look underneath or sometimes you can feel if you're by yourself. Well, we could have used the prop over there. Yeah, we could have. <laughs> yeah, we could have. Um, so, but because if it is a female, um, if they have eggs in their system, you don't want to flip them over and bind their eggs in the system, otherwise they can't lay their eggs, and that's not good. So we want to keep them level. The back part of the shell, I don't know, you want to grab me one? You get any of them? I don't care. Um, thank you. Good idea, Jim. Back part of the shell is going to be concave. There's going to be a dip in. That's for males. Females, they will be flat. And I'll point out a couple other little things. Thanks, Jim. This, so looking at this shell, what, do you get taller me some males or females? What do you think? Yeah. Male. Yeah, this one's a good dip. Oop. Yeah. I can't move. This one's a good dip in there. So you can either feel it from back here or if you have someone helping you, you can look. Um, another thing is the guler horns. Um, males usually have a bigger guler horn, but that's not always the case. You got to kind of use all these aspects together to figure out if it's a male or female. Females might have s shorter ones. Um, some males will have big, long ones, curved ones. Um, another one, a males usually have a big hump back here that's kind of humpy. And females, it kind of goes down and flares out. So let me show you the picture. So a female, the, the back end doesn't really have that hump and it fans out flat plastron, small guler horn, 
usually a short tail. And then a male has that hump back here, kind of goes straight down. And then the dip in the plastron, large guler horn. And um, males can also have these chin glands. A lot of people get worried about their tortoise when they have these glands that come on their chin. They get really big, they kind of fluctuate in size. And uh, males will have big ones. Females usually you don't see them. So they're used for wafting hormones in the air to either attract a female or, or deter a male, which is what these guys are doing right here. Um, so, so they might come out of brumation and they might act differently if this is their first time that they're an, an adult, finally. And they might start fighting, they might start biting each other, chasing each other around, flipping each other over. Those are all signs, and, and if they do flip each other over and you're not home and you don't see it, and if it gets really hot, that's, that's certain death. So, so that's something that we do, it's, we gotta separate them and possibly give one up to adoption. If you can separate your yard so that they have enough room, that would be wonderful. Um, but we can't always do that, so. Um, so nesting is where a female's going around the yard trying to find a nice place where she can dig her, uh, dig her nest. Um, thank you. She might dig a few different places. Maybe she's not sure if she found the right one for her babies. Um, she might act a little differently, stop eating, um, doing things she's never done before. So we do want to, we do, if you know you have a female and you believe that they've been fertilized, you do want to check their, your yard for eggs. Um, now if you know that your female is probably have eggs, you can always get your tortoise x-rayed and they can tell you right away if that's something that you're interested in. Um, being egg bound, they, they just aren't laying their eggs. Um, maybe she keeps digging holes and you keep checking the holes and there's nothing there. Um, but that is something that would have to be surgically fixed. So that's time to see a vet. Um, so again, be very careful handing females with eggs. We don't want to move them around too much, jostle, jostle them too much, or especially flip them over. And here's one female laying her her nest. Um, I can't tell if it's a little wet there. She might have peed on it. And so a female digs with her. So females have, that's one thing I didn't point out. Females have really long back nails comparable to their front. They're about twice as long. Males will have just the same, the same length. So that's another thing you can use. Um, she digs a, a hole, covers each egg, covers the nest. She might pee on it. Walks away, she's done. That's it. Doesn't have to have to feed them. The tortoise comes with everything in its egg that it needs for the first, I think, couple months of life. Um, there's some tortoise eggs comparable to a chicken egg, about the size and shape of a ping pong ball. That's what I'd call it. And they are laying right now. They can lay two to three clutches, so different areas. They might not deposit all their eggs in one area. And about six to 12 eggs. Um, lone females may lay infertile eggs all their lives. And this is, this is the big, the big shocker, is that if a female is fertilized um, once, one time, she can lay eggs for up to 10 or 15 years um, using that same mating experience, using the same sperm. And so each clutch, if each clutch has six to 12 eggs and she can lay two or three per year for the next 10 or 15 years, you're dealing with hundreds of babies from one time of mating. So, that's one reason why we say separate the sexes, please, because it's already hard, it's, we're already at the point where it's hard to find homes for. So we want to pass that out there. Pass it to everyone you know, anyone with a tortoise. 
takes about 90 to 120 days to get the eggs to hatch. Oh, they are so cute. Oh, they are. They're cute. Um, and they're just pretty much little miniature versions of an adult tortoise. Um, they need a smaller, you know, they need a, a certainly a decent area, but a, a safe area. They still need a burrow and they still need plants to browse on a little water dish, a dry burrow, that's important. Um, so the sex of hatchlings is determined by temperature. I always remember this. Um, so females are usually the, they're hot ladies, you know? So <laughs> the warmer of the temperature, hot mamas, there you go. That's what I'm gonna say, hot mamas. And so the warmer of um, this produces females and the, usually the colder part of the nest in the bottom produces males. And if they're right on that line, they can produce um, hermaphroditic, hermaphroditic tortoises too. So that's something that researchers don't know much about either. So that's interesting. Um, so rain behavior, I, I don't know if we're going to get much rain, but we might. Um, they do smell it approaching. And then they come out, they might dig a little hole, they're going to go to a place where um, the rain puddles and they're going to stick their little nose in there. And so they're, they've been, tortoises have been known to come out when it's pouring rain outside and just flooding. They're out and about walking around. It, it's an um, instinct for them because when they are in the wild, that might be the only time in that year or that six months that they're going to that water is available to them. So our, our tortoises might exhibit that same instinct. So our instinct is, is to go run and put a tarp on top of our burrow so that no water enters, but hopefully you've picked a good spot in your yard where it won't flood. Um, but then they're already out and about and you might not see them and they're trying to go back into their burrow and there's a tarp there and they're like, guys, what's going on? I can't get in my burrow. So if you do tarp your, your burrow when it rains, you do want to lift it up so that they can go back in. Oh, he's so cute. And there you go, and they might drink for 20 or 30 minutes. Get that head down in that water. This is a, this is a little tidbit we've had a lot of people ask questions about. So there are some sulcatas in the valley. Those are the big giant tortoises, but they start small too. They start at the same size as a, you know, as a desert tortoise, but they grow very large. And so how to tell the difference? And this is a, a quick and easy tip. Um, desert tortoise have this scoot. It's called a nuchal scoot that a sulcata and most other tortoises don't have. You see how it's missing in this sulcata? where desert tortoises have that. I remember it, the, the nuchal is towards the nose. So that helps me, I guess. Nuchal scoot, just at the neck. And so that's one, re one thing you can easily tell. Some sulcatas will have kind of a little bit pointier. They look a little bit more, um, what's the right word? Uh, like dinosaur -y or, what's that? Armored legs. Spiny, armored legs. Yeah, those are all great descriptions. And, but our tortoises, desert tortoises, are a little bit more smooth. They can be kind of rough too, but they don't, they're not sticking out big like these guys. And we know um, tor sulcatas are a humongous responsibility. Um, we, we certainly have to be aware of that. So maybe what we can do is break now, um, then come back with the with our guest speaker and then continue with more questions at the end if that, if that would work for everybody. So we'll take a quick 10 minute break and then uh, we'll be back with our guest speaker. Thanks. I forgot about the break. Oh. We'd like to welcome Marcy Henson who is going to be talking about the recovery of the desert tortoise. Marcy is from Las Vegas originally and graduated from Oregon State University with a, with a Bachelor of Science in Natural Resources and has held resource management positions with Lockheed Martin Environmental Services, the Las Vegas Valley Water District, the Southern Nevada Water Authority, and the Las Vegas Springs Preserve. So now you can see why it was printed out and I couldn't remember all this stuff. 
Uh, Marcy is considered to be a regional expert on habitat conservation planning and the Endangered Species Act and has served on many advisory committees including the Desert Tortoise Managers Oversight Group and the Desert Tortoise Recovery Implementation Team and is currently the Assistant Director of the Clark County Department of Comprehensive Planning where she oversees planning and zoning issues and serves as the Administrator of the Clark County Multiple Species Habitat Conservation Plan. And she even brought some freebies, so that's yeah, even better. <laughs> so uh, we'll turn it over to Marcy, and uh, thank you for coming. Sure, sure. Uh, good afternoon. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I've actually been working at Clark County on tortoise issues um, for about 12 years now, and so I've talked to this group three or four times um, over the course of, uh, of that history, and it's never been a bigger group. You've never been more technology driven. There's cameras and microphones, and so um, uh, you guys continue to grow and inspire all of us in your work and appreciation for tortoises. So thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the Desert Conservation Program and our work and contributions to the conservation and recovery of the desert tortoise in the wild. So I wanted to give you all a little bit of history of the program. Um, in down? Oh, sorry. Okay. Is that better? Okay. In um, August 4, 1989, the tortoise was emergency listed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as endangered. It was later revised to threatened. Um, just a show of hands, how many people were here in August of 1989? All right, a few of you, very good. So um, it's fair to say that that was a day um, that uh, was fairly um, traumatic to Las Vegas. <laughs> and for those of you who remember, um, once a species is listed on the Endangered Species Act, it, um, en it enjoys a tremendous protections. And at that time in 89, um, we were growing, Summerlin was going in the very first um, part of the master plan community up in Summerlin was going in, the Excalibur Hotel was going in, the first development on the south side of the strip, and so it was quite an impact to, to uh, Southern Nevada in general. Um, from August to December of 1989, the City of Las Vegas, the Southern Nevada Home Builders Association, and other developers um, actually tried to fight the listing of the desert tortoise. They felt like it was a huge economic impact um, and something that they were not at all prepared for. Um, from the moment that the tortoise was listed, there was an immediate and all-encompassing moratorium on any activities that could harm the desert tortoise, and that meant all new construction. Um, under federal law, when the tortoise was protected, you can't harm, harass, move, um, kill, or I like to add, give dirty looks to tortoises <laughs> without a big penalty for doing so. Um, you can get up to a year in jail and $25,000 fine unless you have a permit from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So for those of you who, who were here, we had a lot of these kinds of articles on the front page of the Las Vegas Review Journal about um, delays due to construction um, from the listing of the tortoise and slowing things like um, development of interstate exchanges on the highways and, and things like that. So it was um, headline news every day from August 1989 until about uh, 1991. So, as you might recall from my slide, Clark County did not um, involve itself in the lawsuit to fight the listing of the desert tortoise. We went a different direction. Um, the city, Southern Nevada Home Builders Association, and those developers ended up losing their original uh, injunction. They also lost uh, um, an appeal on that injunction. And so, fighting the listing of the desert tortoise from a regulatory perspective uh, wasn't very fruitful. They spent a ton of money on lawyers and didn't really get anywhere. The county went a different direction. Um, so from December of 1989 until August of 1991, the county pulled together uh, stakeholders involved in, and impacted on desert tortoise issues and hired the help of some expert legal um, assistance in putting together a short-term habitat conservation plan and approaching the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for a permit um, that would allow construction to resume in exchange for conservation actions in a habitat conservation 
Conservation Plan. And that's allowed under the Federal Endangered Species Act. It's called Section 10 of the Act. Uh, applicants can come forward and request a permit to harm habitat of desert tortoises and other listed species in exchange for conserva uh, conserving the species elsewhere. And so that's what the county did. Um, you can't necessarily tell, but that gentleman right there is Senator Harry Reid. Um, that's Jay Bingham. Um, I'm trying to remember who else is in that photo. Uh, Thalia Dondero. So for those of you who've been here for a long time, those are familiar names. One of those guys is still around. He's some big head honcho in DC from what I hear. Um, it was very, very popular that we move forward with this plan. Not a lot of communities had embarked on a regional planning effort and a regional habitat conservation plan and permit. Um, so at the time, we were one of the only counties using the Section 10 process to get a permit in exchange for conserving tortoises elsewhere. So in 1994, we applied for a long-term permit, so more acres of development and more conservation. And then in 2001, we applied for and received for the permit and the plan that we operate under now. So that covers uh, 30 years, 78 species, so we added on just a couple more species to the tortoise mix. Um, it allows for 145 acres of development here in Clark County in exchange for implementing the Multiple Species Habitat Conservation Plan, or MSHCP. Uh, besides the tortoise, there's nothing we like more than our acronyms and bureaucratic talk. So um, if I have any of these acronyms up here that you're not familiar with, please let me know. So that's what we're working on today, is implementing the Multiple Species Habitat Conservation Plan so that development moves forward and we're conserving uh, these species elsewhere in Clark County. So as I mentioned, the permit is an incidental take permit, meaning we are engaged in activities that are otherwise lawful, except for they occur in desert tortoise habitat. So we're incidentally harming the desert tortoise by implementing otherwise legal activities. So our permit term goes to until 2031 or we hit 145,000 acres, whichever comes first. Um, I will tell you at the beginning of the term of this permit, in 2001 to about 2006, we were way outpacing what was projected for those 145,000 acres. And if we would have kept it 2004 to 2005 development um, takedown of acres here in Southern Nevada, we would have been out of permanent acres by 2010. Of course, the economy collapsed in 2008, and um, we have about 60,000 acres left on the permit to get us through 2031. So bottom line of what's in the Clark County MSHCP, it's a, it's a regulatory document, so when you stack the document and all of its appendices up, it's about this tall. So it's very manageable to get through. If you never need some light, bedtime reading, just pull out the MSHCP. But basically what it does is it documents how we're gonna minimize and mitigate impacts to the desert tortoise and other species that are listed in there. So those are things like we manage an 86,000 acre conservation easement out in the El Dorado Valley um, near Boulder City um, and that is listed as it's designated as critical habitat for the desert tortoise it's contiguous with um, a BLM uh, area of environmental concern for tortoises so we manage that conservation easement for the protection of wild desert tortoises we also acquire land so we'll acquire land for desert tortoise that's habitat and then we also do a lot of land acquisition up on the muddy and virgin rivers up in the southeast part of Clark County that's mostly for riparian birds that are listed on the Endangered Species Act so southwestern willow flycatcher, um, yellow-billed cuckoo. So um, those happen along those rivers and we acquire, we've acquired about 140 acres on those rivers combined. Public information education, so you all have been beneficiaries of some of that um, work that we've done. Um, on the table up here we have the stress cushy tortoises. Um, so I tell people that um, sometimes working in the field of desert tortoise conservation is very stressful. Um, and the thing I've learned about those stressed tortoises is it, it is in fact possible to literally pop their heads off. <laughs> So we keep a, a big supply of those just in case. I send those to our friends at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and, and BLM and some of the other regulatory agencies. And we've got pens over there and then we also have car air fresheners with different messages, stay on the trails. So those are um, targeted towards outdoor users and people who might be either hiking or even more importantly um, in vehicles or on off-highway vehicles just to remind them to stay on designated trails so they don't harm tortoise habitat or crush tortoises. Um, and then also for construction workers. So 
tortoises can have a tendency on a construction site to um, find the nearest shade and they'll go right under a truck. So some of the messages on those air fresheners are to remember to look under your vehicle before you um, drive off. And then our, I think our most famous public information effort is the Mojave Max Emergence Program. How many of you have heard of Mojave Max? Very good, everyone's heard of my ex. <laughs> so um, that's an, an incredibly successful program and it's actually been adopted also in southern Utah and parts of the California Mojave Desert. And if you're not familiar with that program, there is a live tortoise up at the Red Rock Visitor Center that BLM manages. Um, and we have a partnership with the Clark County School District for school children to receive assemblies on desert tortoise biology. And then they can go on to the computer, onto the web, and they can guess when Mojave Max is going to emerge from his burrow up at Red Rock. Um, and the winning class gets, well, the, the kid gets a trophy that's like this big. Um, this year, the trophy was as big as the student who won it. <laughs> Um, the teacher gets a laptop computer, the kids get a field trip out to Red Rock, paid for by our program to meet the real live Mojave Max. It's an incredibly um, popular program. Um, getting back into the biology of it all though, we do a lot of habitat restoration for desert tortoise, so working with BLM, um, conducting those activities on the conservation easement I talked about. Um, the, the desert can get beat up for a variety of reasons and so we try to keep pace by also doing habitat restoration um, out in wild tortoise habitat. Tortoise fencing, and I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end of the presentation, and then also lots of research and species monitoring as well. So um, you might be surprised to learn that Clark County, just since 2001, has spent $95 million implementing the Multiple Species Habitat Conservation Plan. Um, I'm actually not, not aware of another community at the county level who's invested that much money in conservation of its wildlife. Um, this is a fact. I was born and raised in Las Vegas, as you all heard. Um, I went off to um, Oregon State and then came back to dry out. Um, so I'm very prideful of our community. And you know, I go places and I hear people talk about Las Vegas all the time and the gluttony and we don't care and it's a desert. And um, so I always get to throw this number up in their face. You know, well, what is your community spent on conserving wildlife? life. I, I don't know that anyone can match that. Um, so how we pay for all of this is by collecting a $550 per acre fee at a time an applicant comes in for a grading permit at any of the municipalities. So a grading permit is required for virtually any type of land disturbing activities in Clark County through all the municipalities, Henderson, Boulder City, Mesquite, um, North Las Vegas. Uh, so every acre that's shown is graded on that grading permit. We assess a $550 per acre fee. Those fees are all centralized with Clark County and then we invest them in an interest bearing account and we use the balance of that account to implement these actions. Um, we also have access to the Southern Nevada Public Lands Management Act. So that's a process whereby the Bureau of Land Management sells BLM lands, the proceeds go into an account, and we're one of the uh, beneficiaries of that account. So um, I'm just showing you here that NRS, Nevada Revised Statutes, is where we get our powers and authorities to run the program to implement those um, fees on construction projects. So for the developer, um, they come in, they turn in their grading perm permit, they get assessed their fee, they write their check, and their only obligation, other obligation is if they see a tortoise on their construction site, they're supposed to call our wild tortoise assistance line. And we go and pick it up out of harm's way. So it's an incredibly efficient environmental permitting process. Um, we have a lot of developers who come here from out of town and they're just amazed at the process, that you come in, you show your grading plan, you write your check, and then you call if you see a tortoise. Um, in many other parts of the Southwest, it's not nearly that, that efficient. And it allows our program to have um, a lot of support from the development community because it doesn't slow down or otherwise impact their development activities. So wanted to talk to you all a little bit about the status of the desert tortoise um, in the wild. So um, this has been a topic of lots of discussion in Clark County over the last year or so. Um, and this happens anytime we get uh, new elected officials 
um, at Clark County. So our program is governed by the Clark County Board of Con Commissioners and they're on a four-year term up to 12 years um, serving total. So every time a new commissioner on comes on board, um, we kind of need to educate them and bring them along, answer any questions they have about the program so that they can understand that the benefits and the advantages of the program and in some cases um, deal with their frustrations about the program as well. So. Um, one of the concerns that's been discussed over the last year has been the misunderstanding about the number of tortoises that people have as pets and how prolific the tortoise is as pets. They do very well in captivity under your guardianship, which we're very grateful for. Um, they don't do as well in the wild uh, given all the pressures and threats that they're under. And so trying to explain that to an elected official can be very tricky sometimes. The purpose of the Endangered Species Act is that we conserve the animal in the wild in its naturally occurring ecosystem. It doesn't matter how many people are doing a great job raising tortoises and caring for tortoises in backyards. The federal law requires that those tortoises, the tortoises in the wild, enjoy that same sort of natural um, uh, wildlife cycle, if you will. And so that gets kind of tricky sometimes with the elected officials because they, they know 10 people who have five tortoises in their backyard and so they don't understand why they're endangered and why we have to spend any money on them. So we've been um, working through that with a couple of commissioners over the last year. So some of their questions were, you know, what is the status of the tortoise in the wild and how do you get the, the tortoise delisted? So I wanted to talk with you all about that for a little bit. The recovery and delisting of the desert tortoise is actually um, an obligation of the U.S. Fish and Wild Life Service. They are the federal government agency who oversees the conservation and recovery of the tortoise. They oversee the um, implementation of the regulations of the Endangered Species Act. So to do that, they also, to figure out what it's going to take to recover the tortoise in the wild, they're obligated to prepare a recovery plan. So their first recovery plan was adopted in 1994 and it sort of sets the path for um, what kinds of um, biological criteria need to be met and what are the conservation actions that need to occur for tortoises to remain and exist in the wild. In 2002, the uh, General Accounting Office of the U.S. government did a review of the listing of the desert tortoise and then also uh, looked at the recovery progress. And it was fair to say that it was pretty critical of recovery progress given how much money had been spent. Um, but what the report did was it validated the original listing of the tortoise. Um, some of you may be familiar with, there's a lot of debate as to whether or not the desert tortoise should have been listed on the Endangered Species Act to begin with, um, the science behind that, and the GAO is supposed to be an impartial, nonpartisan um, inve investigatory arm of the U.S. government that can kind of play referee in some of these debates. And they validated the original listing of the tortoise as reasonable given the information and data that was available. What they didn't find as reasonable was how much money was being spent and how little progress was being made. So in, by, ni or by 2002, the report stated that expenditures on desert tortoise recovery had exceeded 100 million just by the federal agencies alone. So remember that anytime anyone's gonna take action in, in desert tortoise habitat, whether it's the Department of Defense, so when you think about all the defense lands um, in not only in Nevada, but in the Mojave Desert in California, um, they all will require then conservation measures for the protection of the, of the desert tortoise. So when you add up all those types of expenditures, they were exceeding 100 million by 2002. Um, at that time, the Fish and Wildlife Service would it be okay if I took questions at the end? Okay, perfect, <laughs> thank you. Um, at the time, the Fish and Wildlife Service didn't have the information they needed to be able to determine population trends. Um, so they weren't able to say range-wide, what is the status of the tortoise, how many are there, and are the populations increasing or decreasing? And the estimates at that time was that the Fish and Wildlife Service needed about seven and a half million dollars for the first five years, and one and a half million dollars every three to five years thereafter to establish those trends. So we'll talk a little bit about how we've contributed to the Fish and Wildlife Service needs to kind of get a handle on what the population is of tortoises. In 2004, there was a, a recovery plan assessment. So they went back and re-looked at the 1994, a decade had gone by, and they did an assessment of the recovery plan, and the advice of a scientific panel was to update that plan, that there were things in it that were outdated and needed to be revised. 
So in 2011, the Fish and Wildlife Service issued the revised recovery plan and set forth some re uh, recovery criteria. So the most important criteria that the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, set was that tortoise populations need to be increasing over at least 25 years. And the reason why they were looking at a 25 year horizon is because as you all know, tortoises are long lived species. Um, so a generation of tortoise um, might be 25 to 30 years. And so if you're just looking at the five, five year window for species that life, their life cycles are much um, uh, shorter, that might be an appropriate amount of data to collect. But for tortoises, they're so long lived, you have to look at their life cycle over um, at least a generation. Their distribution needs to be increasing, meaning the areas of the Mojave Desert where they occupy needs to be increasing. We need to do a good job um, uh, making sure that tortoises are dispersing on, the on habitat that exists in the Mojave, increasing the quality of that habitat in, in the case of tortoises that won't move into certain areas that would otherwise appear to be good habitat for tortoises. And then ensuring that no net loss of tortoise habitat is occurring. So like I mentioned earlier, um, you can get a permit as long as what you're gonna disturb is offset and conserved elsewhere. So the total estimated cost was about $159 million. The date of recovery, should everything go perfectly, um, would be 2025. I can tell you right now it's not going perfectly. So nobody has a lot of hope that recovery will be reached by 2025. But we are making some progress. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service currently estimates, based on their data, that there are about 295,000 tortoises within a 26,000 square mile range. Um, their baseline population count, as we talked about, is a little unclear. So um, that's what, where we're currently at, and so the Fish and Wildlife Service is wanting to see that number of tortoises go up over the next 20 to 25 years. So what has been our contribution to all of this? So this is just um, a list of all of the different types of conservation actions, studies, and investments that we've made in the conservation recovery of wild tortoises. So we have done a tremendous amount of work on um, disease-related issues and understanding upper respiratory disease and the extent to which it causes a threat to tortoises. Um, for a long time, there was um, based on the best available scientific information at the time, the belief was the, a tortoise contracting upper respiratory disease was certain death. And as a result, many tortoises were euthanized because they would show symptoms and the Fish and Wildlife Service didn't want those symptoms proliferating and becoming an epidemic among wild populations of tortoises. Um, some of the research that we did um, revealed that in fact, it's just like almost when humans get cold. Some of us, if we're in otherwise poor health and we contract a cold, it can mean death for us. It's the same for tortoises. If they're suffering from dehydration, if they're malnourished, if they, you know, they can't find cover, they're, uh, they don't have enough food, if they contract upper respiratory disease, they too um, can die from it. The good news is not all tortoises die. And so just like in um, human epidemiology, those tortoises who survive and make it through upper respiratory disease can pass off stronger um, immune genetics to other tortoises. And so um, some of the study that we did led to a real paradigm shift by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in how they're managing disease and dealing with tortoises that have URTD. Some of the other work that we've done is to look at genetics of tortoises and um, the impacts of moving tortoises on the landscape from a genetic perspective. Is it okay to move tortoises from this population over here to a population over here? What does that do to the overall genetics of the species across the range? And understanding um, based on the desire to translate, uh, translocate tortoises, meaning moving tortoises from one place to another, um, how will that bear out over generations? generations of tortoises, will it cause genetic problems for tortoises? Um, we've done a lot of desert tortoise monitoring, so participating with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to get some of those counts that we were talking about, they were really lacking that data and information, and we've invested a few million dollars in doing range-wide surveys to understand population trends of tortoises. So um, the good news on that front, and I don't have their charts, I need to get copies, but here in Clark County, um, we have um, 
let's see, we have five recovery units. And the current population information for those recovery units is that three out of the five are, the populations are trending upwards. So again, that goal towards recovery. Um, we're really the only community that can say that. Um, most of the other populations in California um, and Utah are actually in decline. And so again, that's something I'm very proud of. It's been a, a lot of money, which is, like I said, difficult to explain to some of the elected officials, but we are starting to see the results from that by those um, increasing population trends. So I just wanted to dive down into the detail of some of this and, and what we do to conserve tortoises. So um, a prior, high priority conservation action in the recovery plan is to prevent tortoises that are occurring out in the wild population from crossing over major highways like, I don't know, the I-15 for example. Back, way back in the, in, in the day, you could be traveling on I-15 and there would be tortoises on I-15. It was not entirely uncommon to come across a tortoise on I-15. Um, so we have fenced pretty much every major roadway here in Clark County to prevent um, tortoise death from crush and kill. Um, we've invested over four million dollars. We have um, installed 222 miles of new tortoise fencing and then we've retrofitted. So you guys notice along the highways a lot of times there's fencing. So we add mesh um, wire to the bottom of that and we um, dig down a certain number of inches to make sure the tortoises don't dig under it so that they don't crawl out onto these roads and, and get crushed and killed. Um, so pretty much all of our major roadways and even moderately used roadways have been, have been fenced as a result of our program. I was just at a symposium on desert tortoise in California a couple months ago and California Department of um, Transportation and California Department of Wildlife were talking about how difficult it was. It's so difficult to fence. <laughs> it's really not that difficult. <laughs> we can send you some information. Get on it. <laughs> um, so that's good. We've used um, Nevada Division of Forestry crews. So these are inmates for the most part that have earned um, privileges to work while they're in jail and so there are many many um, inmates who have gone through our learn how to put in tortoise um, fencing program and they love it they love getting out they love doing the project work some of the other ways we've gotten this fencing done is by um, uh, Boy Scout troops and so a lot of the fencing up in the northeast part of Clark County was done by Boy Scout troops and people earning different merit badges and, and Eagle Scout uh, status as well so um, there's been a lot of community input into tortoise fencing. So a little bit more about our wild tortoise assistance line. So I mentioned earlier that if a construction worker comes across a tortoise on a construction site, they're to call our hotline. And so they call the wild tortoise assistance line and we have a contractor who will go out and collect that tortoise um, from the construction site and then also um, remove it from harm's way. So we also have a construction worker training program and then as I mentioned we have lots of giveaways for construction workers to remember to call us. Um, we're right now we're working on a tortoise box so that construction workers, the foreman gets a tortoise box so that when they find a tortoise they have a box to put it in and there's our number, it's very convenient and handy for them. So I'm excited to see the tortoise boxes and see how they're used. We also do, as I mentioned, a lot of educational work. Um, we have a couple of videos up on our website. Um, and some of these are, are um, aimed at youth and um, teenagers, and then some of them are also aimed at adults. Um, you know, just focusing on making the right choices when you're out in the desert and um, you're trekking around. Um, you know, you can either choose to be a desert dude or a desert doofus. <laughs> So this is a little more about our conservation easement. This is out in Boulder City. So this right here is 95. So this is the road that you take to get to Laughlin. Um, and then 93 is up here. It's an 86,000 acre conservation easement. It's one of the largest private conservation easements for desert tortoise throughout its range. Um, it's actually city of Boulder City land. And as some of you may know, they have um, a, a real progressive view on growth. They don't like a lot of growth and so they were very happy to sell Clark County as a part of this program a conservation easement. So there are uh, prohibited uses. Um, you can't develop on these lands, you can't camp, you can't shoot. Um, it's all passive recreation. Um, 
for the protection of desert tortoises. So this is designated as critical habitat for the tortoise. That's one of the obligations of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. When they list an animal, they need to tell all of us where the most critical parts of its habitat occurs. And this easement happens to be part of it. Um, an interesting thing that we have going on here is this is actually an energy zone donut hole. Um, so back in 1995 when they purchased this from Boulder City, they wanted this energy zone. There's a marketplace substation right here that already existed on the site. Um, and we thought, you know, okay, whatever, I don't know what you're going to do with that. Well, now it's completely developed as solar renewable energy. And Boulder City's got it going on. They're very forward thinking. So they lease all of that out at a, at a pretty high premium. And um, those solar projects deliver their power through marketplace. Most of it goes to LA. Um, but it causes us to have a real tight partnership with the city of Boulder City and with those energy developers to make sure that they're completely surrounded by critical habitat for tortoise and that um, no, none of the activities that they're taking are um, in any way disrupting tortoises. So we've designated roads. So the green lines that you see up here are designated roads. Um, so you can access the easement. You can't go any more than 25 miles an hour and only on designated roads so that we decrease the um, fragmentation of habitat to tortoises. We have, we pay for a Boulder City law enforcement officer that's completely dedicated 40 hours a week to protecting the easement. Um, and at first we were a little worried about this, that um, a police officer wasn't going to be very enthusiastic about busting people because they were hurting tortoises. And we've had a really good um, string of officers who take it very seriously and um, write citations and issue tickets under Boulder City Ordinance for people who are driving off-road, camping, shooting, um, doing things out there that they're not supposed to do. It's actually one of, um, for when they go in and do shift bids, this is a very high uh, competition assignment to get. So we've been really excited about that. Um, and we do a lot of restoration in this area as well. Um, we've decommissioned quite a few roads out there. At one time there was a, an OHV racetrack on the easement. Um, and so we've been res slowly restoring all of those areas so that they can be used by wild desert tortoises. Um, we also currently have an, a tortoise occupancy monitoring project. And so the purpose of that project is to know exactly on the easement, where are tortoises utilizing the easement and where are they not, so that we can focus our protection on efforts, we can tell the officer, you know, there's not as many tortoises up here as there are down here. So focus down here, or restoration efforts, etc. So I'm talking a little bit about this. So these are all of our different plots where we're looking for tortoises. Um, and, oh, I'd say see us at the poster session tonight. There won't be a poster session, but if you want a poster, I can send you one. <laughs> so that is um, a summary of what we're doing in the conservation program for desert tortoises, and our emphasis is on wild tortoises. Um, but I will um, end on this note, and that is to say that um, your organization and the work you do on um, providing homes to desert tortoises that are pets is incredibly important to this whole conservation of desert tortoises. Um, and as, as you all are aware, um, the Fish and Wildlife Service tries to keep a bright line between pet tortoises and wild tortoises, and um, there are a lot of pet tortoises, and so we need caretakers and folks who are going to provide appropriate care and housing for those tortoises. Um, and we really appreciate the partnership and work that, that you all do. And um, you're an organization that's been growing. You've become more sophisticated and more organized. And um, we certainly need a nonprofit group like you um, to help us all work on these tortoise issues. So we really appreciate it. And I'm ready for questions if you have any. I'm going to go to this lady first, and I'll come back to you. Yes? How large an, an organization? That's a great question. Our program is a division within the Department of Comprehensive Planning. We currently have eight staff people on board. Um, there's uh, the plan administrator. I serve as a plan administrator. We have, let's see, one cler or two clerical people. We have a senior biologist and a biologist. And um, the rest of our staff is composed of environmental specialists who are mostly um, consumed with the project management work of these things, making sure these projects get done on the ground, um, maintaining the budgets for those projects, etc. Does that answer your question? 
yeah, most of the projects are outsourced. We do some of them internally, but most of them are outsourced to environmental firms or um, we, um, we do work with um, uh, some landscaping fir firms for restoration work. We do um, outsource some of our marketing work as well. Mm -hmm. So the question was um, on the slide where I referenced the general accounting office report and that they had commented on $100 million had been spent. So all the general accounting office was looking at was dollars spent by federal agencies. So it didn't take into account state expenditures, local expenditures, private developer expenditures. Okay. All right, yes. Um, yeah, my question is, I guess, kind of directed to the, uh, the listing or delisting. And, and I would be one of those politicians who would say, you know, wait a minute, you have these thousands of tortoises now that have urbanized in the valley. Mm -hmm. That was their habitat. Now they, you know, we've got all these thousands of tortoises, and yet those aren't considered part of the tortoise population. Is there a way that they could do a separate designation, like a wild population is threatened, but the urban population is abundant? I mean. Right. Work around that somehow because it just right. You should run for office. No, it's <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly the question that we get. How can it be listed when there are so many of them? I don't know if you guys have heard these figures before, but um, we've had tortoise biologists tell us that their estimate of captive tortoises just in Clark County is somewhere around 50,000. I have no idea if that's accurate or not, um, but that really is the crux of the issue for some of the politicians, is how can they be listed as threatened? So um, the situation that the Fish and Wildlife Service is in is that the law doesn't allow them to count tortoises that have become, that are captive and have become pets. The law requires that um, these animals are, they exist and they're recovered in the wild in their naturally occurring ecosystem. And so there's no way for the service to count captive tortoises in people's backyard toward that population. Now, that's the legal, you know, administrative, but nothing prevents us from understanding. I mean, what I tell folks is, um, the species is threatened under the law. There's no chance of it going extinct, at least in the next, you know, how, you know, my great great grandchildren may have pet tortoises, but they may go extinct in the wild if we're not careful. And that's the differentiation. So the law is trying to protect wild ecosystems um, and not so much what's going on in, in, you know, the urban environment. Well, and I know they're working to repatriate or relocate or translocate you know, existing populations that, you know, have thrived mm -hmm. and, and kind of help, you know, supplement the wild population. But my question, like I said, is given that fact that there's really two populations that they look at, they're like, you know, they kind of mesh and cross over. Mm -hmm. Couldn't they do some kind of, you know, categories that, yes, wild populations is threatened, but urban population is thriving, you know, right. you know address them separately some of that? Right. Um, not under the current law, but um, yeah, the Endangered Species Act, we get that a lot too. Why can't we just change the Endangered Species Act? And so um, many, many um, folks in Congress have tried to do that. In fact, there are sessions pretty much every week about making amendments to the Endangered Species Act. Um, the Endangered Species Act was passed in 1974. Um, there, there have been a couple of amendments to it since, but it became, once people realized its implementation, I'll tell you guys a quick story about um, the most famous case in um, the Endangered Species Act is the case of the snail darter. And it's a fish that was about this big that occurred in um, Tennessee River Valley. And Tennessee River Valley Authority was charged by Congress to build a dam to supply energy and water resources in Tennessee. At that time, when uh, that was, and it was after the law was enacted, and so the, the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service is trying to exercise its authority to protect the snail darter and um, prohibit the dam from being built. And at that time, Al Gore was against the snail darter and the Endangered Species Act, and Newt Gingrich from Georgia was all for it. <laughs> 
So times have changed, um, but what's been, what remains the same about the Endangered Species Act and its implementation is that it's an incredibly polarizing piece of legislation with incredible powers. <clears throat> so it's not easily changed, especially given this, the functionality of our current Congress. One more point on the bottom. And mm -hmm. I went to the Peregrine Falcon, if anybody knows mm -hmm. the name. Mm -hmm. So the Falconers got involved because the Peregrine Falcon got listed as a day and was involved with Falcon. So they got involved, did the, did the private breeding, captive breeding, mm -hmm. and got the Peregrine Falcon delisted mm -hmm. because people got involved with the private did the captive breeding. And now it's available and it's, you know they found the DDT and all of that. Mm -hmm. But they got involved and got it delisted. So it can happen because mm -hmm. of people's involvement. Yeah. Just like us, we're the invisible right. heart supporting this whole, you know. Right. Yeah. Program. You know, the county um, has been very, very supportive of, um, you know, we've actually championed with the Fish and Wildlife Service a sort of a citizen science component to all of this. And um, there was this weird dynamic going on at the Desert Tortoise Conservation Center where um, pretty much from 1994 until just a couple years ago, tortoises that were going into the center were unwanted, domesticated, held in captivity tortoises. And the, sci the scientists have done a tremendous amount of research at the Desert Tortoise Conservation Center, but the subjects that they were studying had been captive, domesticated animals. They were not wild animals. <laughs> um, and they were extrapolating the results of that science to the wild populations. And they did it for over a decade. Um, and then when the recovery plan was revised in 2011, one of the number one recovery actions is population augmentation, meaning the service is showing us that trend lines in these recovery areas are going down. That means there's space for additional tortoises. We know where they could get some tortoises. We told them uh, we have some tortoises. Um, and so after a lot of duress, um, the Fish and Wildlife Service changed its policy and started allowing translocation um, of desert tortoises that were being held at the center, not just to this area out near Gene, which was called the large scale translocation site, but out into other, um, pop other populations. And so we've really been advocating that they look at a citizen science component where, now I will say we can't, there's no breeding program that's just allowed people just to breed a species of wildlife in their backyard and then go dump it somewhere. It, it needs to be um, a very sophisticated breeding program. I happen to think you all are capable of something like that given the right set of guidance and parameters. Um, and then we have sort of this constant supply of tortoises that can um, be put out into the wild to achieve that conservation recovery goal of population augmentation. Um, the service is very um, conservative and there are some really good examples of how mixing um, captive animals and wild animals has been disastrous. Um, there are some species of salmon that occur where um, farm-raised salmon, and it's happening right now, um, are causing um, the crash of populations of wild salmon up in the Northwest. And so they're, as an organization, they tend to be very conservative anyways. And so, you know, it might take us a while to talk them through this and to have them gain um, some comfort in this area. But those discussions have been occurring. And, you know, my hope is that they'll continue to occur. Um, it just takes a fish and wildlife service a little bit. You know, I talked about for, it, it was close to 15 years that the service had a policy that if a tortoise showed URTD, it was to be euthanized. Um, when additional science was done, they realized you're killing potentially um, the, the strongest parts of the population and you're really potentially going to cause only the most vulnerable tortoises to URTD left in wild populations. You've got to keep the ones that can come through URTD and have stronger immune response and put those back in the population. So they're just a very conservative organization. So we have to be patient, kind of walk them through that process. And, you know, I'm hopeful, but... Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, there's a limited land to be developed. So once this limit has been reached, where is the $550 per acre going to come from to support this program? Uh, that's a great question. So. Um, the county has been working on an amendment to the Multiple Species Habitat Conservation Plan since about 2008 when we thought we were going to run out of acres. Um, and so we've been working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on an amendment for additional acres of development. So, you know, and this happens a lot in, species, in, in tortoise recovery right now, which is that 
really the only funds that are available are funds that are available from the um, development of tortoise habitat. It's a very perverse incentive and it's been discussed a lot by the Fish and Wildlife Service um, and, and others. So another huge source of funding right now is all the development that's occurring for solar projects on BLM land. They're raising a tremendous amount of money but it's at the expense and cost of tortoise. Um, so um, in some ways the good news is we are trying to get a permit to develop more acres and conserve elsewhere so we would anticipate the funding would continue under a scenario like that. Um, we're likely going to have to increase our fee from $550 an acre. Um, everything costs more these days. Um, our proposed permit term would be an additional 50 years so from 2031 you know, adding on 50 years to that, so 2081. Um, so, you know, we hope to at least be some sustained amount of funding for that effort. Again, the bad news is it comes at the expense of developing uh, tortoise habitat, but at least there would be some form of funding. Um, we're also required to have a, a fund balance, so um, we went into 2008 with about a $50 million fund balance. And we've been um, pretty much operating out of that fund balance um, since 2008. We've been operating in the red because, you know, economic development just crashed. Um, and so, you know, managing that fund balance appropriately, um, anything that's left in the fund balance, even past 2031, and our projections show that there will be money, would be spent, it can only be spent on the conservation recovery of the tortoise under state law. So. Yes. Can you explain the, the issues, the, the standoff between Clive and Bundy and the BLM, and I, when I read articles about it, talk about, you know, disabled tortoises and stuff. Can you, can you just explain to me what the issues are? Is it a conflict between land for cattle and land for tortoises, or I just didn't understand it. Um, I'd be happy to discuss that with you after the session, okay. when I'm not wearing a microphone and being filmed. All right. <laughs> yes. Uh, are the, the conservation areas that you are putting out for the developments happening, do those have to be in Clark County? Um, yeah, so far it's been um, all occurring in Clark County. So the, the thinking is, from a conservation biology standpoint, um, you know, if you're disturbing this type of habitat in this area, you want to do conservation close to those areas. Um, but we have talked about looking elsewhere. Um, but for right now, we've been able to find conser other conservation lands in Clark County. And the, the interesting twist to that, though, is there's not a, private land, a lot of private land in Clark County. Um, Bundy is an example of that. So we all go to the BLM, whether you're cattle ranching or doing conservation or um, you know, needing additional land for development. So we have a partnership and agreement with Bureau of Land Management. Um, in fact, associated with our early permits, BLM designated areas of critical environmental concern, both because they had to do that under the law when the tortoise was listed and because we were coming to them saying, if we have to conserve tortoises on private land, there won't be much development in Southern Nevada. So, so far, um, we've partnered with Bureau of Land Management to do um, those conservation areas mostly on BLM land. So they're usually referred to as areas of critical environmental concern. So there's um, Paiute El Dorado, which is in the south part of the county. It's south of the conservation easement I was showing you all. And then most of the rest of them occur up in the northeast part of Clark County, um, Gold Butte Pacoon, Area of Critical Environmental Concern, Mormon Mesa, um, Coyote Springs, I know I'm missing one, Gold Butte, did I say Gold Butte? I already said that one, darn it. I can't remember the other one. Is there a map on the ground? Uh, yes, there is, and um, I have a card that I can give you afterwards if you'd like to so contact me and I can get you a map. The crap that's all happening in the Ivan Paw Valley with the solar thing, has nothing to do with you and the county using that land as tortoise relocation areas? Um, so in terms of what's occurring in Ivanpah Valley, 
Um, Island Paw Valley is where the original large-scale translocation site was for tortoises. So um, early on in permits under uh, the Kerr County plan, we were taking tortoises off construction sites, taking them to the Desert Tortoise Conservation Center, and then at the right time of year, we were translocating them to the large-scale translocation site. Um, this goes back to um, the Fish and Wildlife Service being very conservative. So basically from 1991 until just a couple years ago, the only place where they would allow tortoises to go was to this huge pen <laughs> out near Jean. Um, and so there's the large scale translocation site. In recent years there have been um, two huge solar developments that have gone in on the Nevada side of the Ivanpah Valley. Bright Source and then First Solar is getting underway as we speak. The first solar project is being allowed to translocate tortoises off of their site in Ivanpah Valley to a new area of critical environmental concern. And um, I forget what they're calling it. They might be calling it the Ivanpah Area of Critical Environmental Concern. It was just adopted um, a couple months ago. It was adopted in the environmental assessment documents for the first source project. So. Um, and then the other complicating factor in the Ivanpah Valley is um, Clark County has identified a need to have a supplemental airport in Southern Nevada. Eventually McCarran will reach its capacity and um, they had an independent study that was done more than a decade ago um, and it identified that if Southern Nevada was going to have a supplemental airport that was actually going to be housed in Southern Nevada and not in Utah or California, the only place for it really to go was Ivanpah Valley. Um, and so Basically, the supplemental airport would be just down the slope from the new area of critical environmental concern. So the whole valley would be destroyed by development? Um, well, all of the rest of it's BLM land, so, and it's not in disposal area. So they just identified a 32,000 acre ACEC, the Ivanpah ACEC. Um, BLM has identified the rest of Ivanpah Valley as a solar exclusion avoidance, I think it's avoidance area. Um, so the reason, my understanding from the BLM is that the reason why First Solar and Bright Source were allowed to continue is because they had applications in before those policies were in place and they had to act on those applications. And BLM's a multiple use agency and so once somebody comes in with an application, unless they have certain policies in place, um, unless there's some really good reason why they shouldn't allow that use to occur, they are in a position of having to allow that use to occur. So in their minds, they thought, well, if we allow Bright Source and First Solar, but we gain a 32,000 acre ACEC in Ivanpah that doesn't currently have one, and all of the rest of it is designated as multiple use, even the large scale translocation site is designated as multiple use. You can target shoot, you yeah. can do OHV. So, um, so you know, there's, there's development that's occurring. Um, and there's new conservation that's occurring, but it's a very delicate balance and there's strong emotions on all sides for, for certain. Yeah, but, but, but as of right now, um, Ivanpah is managed by BLM, pretty much the whole valley. There have been applications in from solar developers. There's an application in for an airport. Um, the rest of it um, will be parceled out by BLM based on future land use actions. Yeah, any other questions? No? All right, well, thank you so much for having me.